Amigos, bienvenidos al episodio número 5 de esta serie de entrevistas. El día de hoy, como siempre, les tengo a una invitada muy especial. Ella es subdirectora del OPS Lab eh, del Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA, que es, en las siglas es GPL. Ella es Sasha Samoshina. Un aplauso. It's like everyone here is like clapping in this moment. <laughs> yeah. So, Sasha, welcome to the Biologist Apprentice. I'm super excited having you here. Uh, I feel super honored. How are you? I'm doing fine um, inside uh, of my home, my beautiful plant here back there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm so happy to be on the program. I'm so happy you found some time to talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like in the other way around. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Sasha, uh, she's really awesome, and you're going to find out why I'm uh, telling you this. So I want to start this conversation uh, talking to you a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. So how you uh, combine science and art and music, because I find it like really interesting. So uh, you moved from uh, Russia to the U.S. to study a career in film and video. Mm -hmm. So I want to know how you discovered that this was the, the path for you? How did you discover, okay, I'm gonna do this career? And have you, um, if you ever imagine to, oh, someday I'll be working at NASA? Okay, these are great questions. So I should say I actually moved um, to America from Russia when I was four. So my parents moved me, it was not specifically to go to school, um, but, I think it's an interesting move because I think about my career trajectory a lot in terms of what would have happened if I stayed in Russia and would the same opportunities be available to me. Specifically at the time that I moved, which was Russia's Soviet Union was falling and, you know, in terms of infrastructure, it was a very difficult place to sort of rebuild, right? So I feel very honored to have immigrated to, uh, to America when I did. So. I was a very strange little kid. Um, there are many videos of me, very hyper, always like selling tickets to stuff to my parents being like, there's a ballet show. And then just like, you know, just playing every role, a lot of theater stuff. Um, but as I started going, I took school very seriously at a very early age. So like I was doing my homework, always kind of obsessed with my homework in such a way that sometime in eighth grade, my parents said, hey, do you want to just maybe hang out and not do your homework all the time? And I was like, no, I have to be really good. Because the idea was I wanted, I had trouble in sciences in terms of excelling in them, but I really love biology. Um, and so by high school, I was in advanced biology classes and I struggled in them, but I really liked it. So the plan for me was to actually be a biologist or study undergrad in that. So Um, the idea was going gonna, was gonna to apply to all of these schools uh, for university. And then I was also, I was taking what we call, um, there's a thing called International Baccalaureate, which was a free program that's international, um, if you don't know. And it's awesome. So it's basically made for people in the military, which my family is not, but it allows for a worldwide curriculum. So you kind of get more than just something you would usually get in the U.S. or get in a different country. You can also go from one country to another and have the same program. So they have two year spans of, of you know, two years of math and then two years of science and then you, you kind of um, test out of it. Very kind of like a European um, model. So I was taking art and I had to actually get up at 4.30 in the morning uh, to drive to school to take to take art in zero hour, which my paintings were like very dark and sad because I was just so sleepy. Like they all just look terrifyingly sad, um, but I loved it. And so when I was thinking and considering schools, I actually ended up only applying to art universities. And my parents were sort of like, what's going on? And I said, you know what? I think I, I, think I just want to try, I, I, I love art. I want to see how I can combine it and kind of take the parts of science that I'm not excelling in right now and basically communicate them. Um, and I didn't really quite know what I was doing, honestly. Um, and I did get into the schools that I wanted to get into. The one that I ended up going to was the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and I loved Chicago as a city. I went there once. I was like, mom and dad, I have to go to Chicago. They were like, okay. I went and checked it out and I was like, cool. Okay, I'm going to move here. Um, 
And I saw all their programs and they had a really cool program for film, video, and new media, which I wouldn't find out about until later because I started out in painting and that's what my scholarship was in. Um, but I quickly realized that painting wasn't really my, my thing. Um, I like it and I liked making really silly kind of infuriating things that my teachers were not very uh, big fans of. Um, I once had a teacher say that it was, I had made the worst thing that he had ever seen. And <laughs> to me, that was like, well, at least it's memorable because you truly do remember the worst thing you've ever seen. Um, and I think he was being kind of, you know, he was being funny. Um, but I just found that program not to be exactly right for me at the time. And so I found this film program um, where it was experimental and conceptual. You could blend a lot of, you know, crazy high level concepts and experiment with with music, which I'd also have been playing piano since I was basically six years old and then started playing guitar. I had a band when I was like 16. Um, so I saw video as a thing that could be both educational and combine all of the talents that I already had and then get also, you know, build a base. Kind of what you're, what we're doing here. You know, YouTube didn't exist then, but you know, it started happening while I was in college and I was like, oh my gosh, this even spreads the ability of this to be an actual thing that could, you know, change perspectives and communicate to more places in the world. So I think I answered some of your questions there. I kind of went off on a rant. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. I, I love it. I, I'm like so entertained and intrigued right now. So because I, I was like thinking, but how... Oh, where, where the musical background comes from? Now I understand. Yeah. Very, well, I mean, very so my father is a is a classically trained guitarist, and he actually played oh. a lot of rock and roll gigs of like covers in St. Petersburg. That's the town in Russia that I'm from. Um, my mother actually was never musical, and then four years ago, just started singing opera. And now she's, they live in Washington and she's in actual productions and opera productions. And it, I mean, opera is the most difficult thing you could possibly just pick up. And yeah. she was like, oh no, I kind of knew music. I just, you know, now I have the time and passion for it. And it, that inspired me. I was like, you're crazy. And I have a brother that's six years older than me and he super musical, played jazz. You know, he started playing cello and then upright bass and then electric bass. And I sort of followed suit. He, I was like, oh, he's playing cello, I should play piano. And then, oh, he's playing upright bass, I should start doing trumpet. And so like, so we could constantly play like jazz together or rock music together. And we started our first band when I was like, I want to say 13, really, but we got really serious when I was 15, 16, 17. And so in high school, I like had to miss prom because we had a gig going. And um, actually the venue of that place burned down that night. So there was no concert. But uh, we were playing like, you know, like rock kind of punky experimental music in a three piece band. And that was, I mean, I think music really helps you to think outside the box. I think music is a is a format that lets you just like loosen up. And I was never I'm part of that belief in sometimes like in terms of like punk rock, for instance, like. In punk, you don't have to be perfect at the ear instrument, but you need to like be able to feel stuff and know some things. And then you can grow within the context of like a group that you're playing with. And I think I love that. That's kind of how I want to always go through life is just figuring it out and, um, you know, experimenting and, and feeling it out and being inspired by stuff. Right. That makes that makes me. Happy. Yeah. Right now you're just giving me. A, such a great life advice that I'll, I'll take into practice because for me it's kind of the same thing I always say like okay you can make a plan but usually your plans never work <laughs> because life I, yeah is, it's true it's like that so figuring out things in the way you are doing things it's the way you discover the things that you like and the yeah. things you're passionate about so it's really interesting And okay, I'm I'm gonna skip to 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 that, okay. and then I'm I'm gonna go back. Okay. Because when when I when I met you, Sasha, I met you at uh, at Smash. Mm -hmm. So I remember, like you know, when oh, yeah. when you have like opportunities like this. In my case, 
it was a very like defining moment for me because okay i got this i need to figure it out if science communication is really the thing i want to do in mm -hmm. life because i was like very excited and video and production and blah 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 and okay sophia if you're gonna do this you need to get excited and see what it goes yeah. so i got this chance it was i always say it was like disneyland for me because it's like probably yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna doubt about it. it. It probably, it was like the best week in my life because I met so many cool people and so, uh, and one of those cool people was you. <laughs> so, because I, I remember like uh, checking all those presentations and then, and I vividly remember you like going up on the stage. Oh, this girl that, that works for NASA was well, okay, but that, that in the, in the meantime, it was okay. It's really cool, and then you start talking about all these projects and the pictures and Mars and <laughs> even though, I mean, I know things about the space, but it's not like my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. But you made me to get excited about a, su uh, a subject I don't really uh, are like close about it. So it was like, it's so cool. <laughs> that makes me very happy. I like it was, I need to meet, meet her and I remember I don't know I probably uh, tag you on an Instagram picture and I send you a message and I was like please I just need to her to be good to me <laughs> because I don't know so and then you were like super nice and then I met you and I talked up with you like probably 10 minutes and I was like someday hopefully someday I get the chance to to take a little bit more with her and Look at me, <laughs> we're not here. Well, I'm so happy to hear about you wanting me to be on the program, but also I know it can be difficult to walk up to people. I find it difficult myself sometimes, but the worst thing that could happen is someone's just like, I can't, right? But for me, yeah. I always say this in all my talks, I'm like, here's my information, send me a message. Like, if you have a question, if you wanna know more, just let me know. And I think people are consistently surprised that I always answer, but I'm like, I'm just a human person that loves to, you know, both have people teach me things and learn stuff from them and uh, also maybe advice that you may need or learning from mistakes that I've made. I think that's all very important. So I'm always keeping that promise. And I think people get kind of weirded out. Sometimes they're like, oh, my God, she answered. Is she crazy? <laughs> and I'm like just enough crazy. Um, hopefully, you know, the idea is that I would be helpful, but I think, you know, actually, I think the cool part about just communicating on the internet and the thing that at least in my first career at JPL when communications, which we'll get into, but the thing that I think is really cool is like we, we live stream our lectures, for instance, um, they're called Von Karman lectures. We have them on Thursdays. I believe it's the first Thursday of every month. Um, and in the live stream at the beginning of my job, when I was first at JPL, I was actually on the other end of the stream talking to people and gathering their questions. And when the people actually see their question being asked to the presenter, they're like, oh, my God. It's like, yeah, yeah, we, we want to make you feel like you're here, you know, and a lot of the people watching online are people that are students or interested and they and they live in other places and other countries in different time zones that were people that would, you know, stay up at odd hours, you know, in Australia or something just to catch this lecture and ask the question. So I think that part of, you know, where we are right now with technology is really exciting. And frankly, I think we need more of it in the world. Um, this like instant communication and humanizing of people without monetization, without all of that, just, you know, talk. Yeah, I, I agree. I think one of the main, main things I, I want to focus on my channel and the things I do online is that because we are human, so we mm -hmm. need to engage and have a conversation about different subjects, a like very serious one and not that serious one. So because you are, you are part of this world and we are like seeing that right now because we yeah. are having like the same problem in all the world so it's it's kind of uh, complicated so we're going to back a little bit so uh, what was your first job my first job uh so you mean like as an adult person or as a younger person no as an I adult person professional, an adult. Adult. professional okay. <laughs> because i've had a lot of i i mean i also like to talk about how i've had a lot of jobs 
while I was, um, before I actually went to university, I took a year off to play music with my brother and I lived in Seattle and I went to a uh, community college to get all of my prerequisites done because it was, you know, just more costly uh, to, to do them at a big university, much cheaper. And like the teachers are awesome in, in community colleges all around America. Um, I worked very many weird jobs then. I actually worked at a rave where I sold pizza and soda. So no job is a bad job, I guess, because you need to make ends meet. But I would say my first real like Sasha Samoshina career beginning would be uh, when I got my job. Well, at first it was an internship at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. So I actually started interning there my sophomore year of college. Um, and that's the one advice piece of advice I always give to all students that ask me, what should I do in terms of jumpstarting a career? Get an internship that has you hands-on doing things. Um, and again, I, I, I've always been obsessed with museums because of that biology love and that love of, I also love archaeology, anthropology. Because of that love, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to work in one of the most state-of-the-art museums with collections that are incredible. Um, but of course, you know, I, in the fake it till you make it, my first assignment, so I worked in environmental conservation programs. Again, this is me, sophomore year. Um, and my boss at the time, Dan Brinkmeyer, um, who is incredible, uh, was like, hey, um, didn't explain the full project to me. And this was a lesson because I should have been like, can you, you know, educate me on the full project. But he said, I need some data visualization of deforestation. Can you do that in a creative way? And I was like, sure. And he's like, do you know Flash? And I was like, yeah. And I did not know Flash. <laughs> and I've never done data visualization to save my... And so I was like, okay, YouTube, here we go. Um, and different kind of lessons online. So I quickly figured out how to do it. You know, at this point, people are like, Flash. And I'm like, before it was cool and people used Flash everywhere. That's why we don't do it anymore because it's broken. Well, we use it sometimes. Um, and so what I made was this part, you know, this animation, my boss was really excited about it. And then he came back like a month later and was like, oh my, so I had been doing other stuff since then. And he's like, oh my gosh, your data visualization really helped in, in the, um, in the presentation. And, you know, we saved that land. And I was like, what? And he was like, oh, well, we're using this to help and save some Amazonian rainforest. And so what you showed was part of a data visualization to stop the government from taking this land away from, you know, the native people there and, you know, having big industry do whatever they're doing. And that's when I was like, impact directly, you know, making art through science and directly impacting a world bigger than yours um, in a very small way. But that feeling is kind of what made me like this intersectionality of being in this world of science communication and science kind of understanding and being able to both. And at that point, I wasn't really working with experts. At that point, that was really my first assignment. And I sort of pretended that I knew what I was doing until I actually did. Um, and from then on, I got, you know, harder and harder assignments. I ended up making, uh, editing a documentary, a five-hour documentary um, with uh, the Kofan people. We actually had three people from the Kofan tribe come and who spoke no English, and I did not speak their native tongue. And we made a video together uh, to, again, help to first preserve their culture, but also show their government why we needed to preserve their culture. Um, so I got to do all, and like, this is all while, going to full-time school. Um, I also had a separate job just to make money because this one paid, but very little. That wasn't the case and that's never been the case for me. Um, but it's really what sparked this kind of, uh, this, this world for me. And the Field Museum, I can't say enough, is just such a nourishing place and such a loving place because it is about bettering the world there very much. The research that they do is funded through you know crazy means there's not a lot of funding all of the people are such experts they are just resilient um and they took me in and they embraced my weirdness you know and when I when I finally after school um I graduated in 2009 so that was right at the down point when the economy was not doing great at all here so it was not often that 
I was hearing of friends from my school, from my university, getting jobs in the arts. And so I continued my internship until I got hired full time as a media producer at the field. So I worked with two other people um, as a head media producer, meaning that I got to create all of the videos and the exhibits that um, were happening at the fields. The first one being helped out with mammoths and mastodons. Um, the last exhibit I worked on was mummies. Um, I, I watched that one. Yeah. And, uh, it's so cool. I mean, in my life, have I, I have ever seen something like that. It was like very impressive. Like, oh, it's a real mummy. Even though yeah. we have here in Mexico, we have mummies, but I never been to that museum. <laughs> but I, I think I, I need to go because I'm so interested in the things. <laughs> so. I think also, I mean, so the, the work about conservation that I'm talking about is actually a permanent exhibit at um, the field. It's called Restoring Earth. And that's really the last big thing I worked on. And again, all kudos to the field because they would be like, hey, do you know how to make sound? At one point, I did translation for a mammoth that came that was the oldest, most preserved mammoth ever found. And since I know Russian fluently, they were like, hey, do you want to work extra and just help mount this mammoth and be in like a gas mask, basically, and do interpretation? And I was like, and because we had all, we were working with formaldehyde and stuff, so we had to wear protective. And I was like, yes, I yes. How would I say no to this? You know, um, a mammoth with a career all the way from Siberia, like, okay, I'm never going to be able to do this anywhere else. Or, you know, so for Restoring Earth, I digress. For Restoring Earth, I got to help install the hardware for um, the soundtrack. So, you know, basically all the hardware for all the sound in the museum. Um, I got to compose music for one of the theaters and also some of the shorts. I did voiceovers. I produced a bunch of shorts um, for the communities section. Um, and so Restoring Earth is very much about, so the work we did with environmental conservation programs um, uh, and the, the thing I was talking about, saving Amazonian rainforest specifically, that project, um, why am I blanking on this? Rapid inventory program. So actually the field was very, um, their research was very important to this way of working where they gather scientists um, from the field, actually fly them into the part of the Amazon that's being uh, threatened by big lumber companies, what have you, you know, your imagination can run wild with how often things are threatened. And so these scientists are all experts in different parts of their fields, right? So we have a person that's studying birds, we have paleontologists, we have anthropologists, we have just regular, like, mammologists. Um, and they basically go and do a two week survey, a three week survey, excuse me, of the land. Um, it's actually basically a two week survey. And then they basically take all the research and make a document out of it. And then they go present it to the government and say, listen, we found this many new species of X, Y, Z. We found, you know, this culture that has um, this ritual that's never been recorded. Um, you cannot take this land because this land is important and this land has creatures that if you take it, they will never come back to earth again. Um, so I might be blanking on the number numbers, but I think um, by the end of restoring earth being done, we had saved like around 28 million acres of land. I hope that's the right number. Um, and also started the first, the third largest park in Peru, Cordillera Azul. And so all from the efforts of these, of, of these scientists and their research partners, but really the field taking the head of it. So Restoring Earth explains that, has a beautiful theater um, uh, with three different projections. Um, my two colleagues went and filmed uh, a bunch of different, really amazing footage um, in the Amazon. And then it kind of transitions into, this exhibit transitions into, okay, so how Amazon might seem far away. These are great numbers, it's really exciting, but, what about Chicago? And so we go into talking about sustainability in Chicago, what the museum does to sustain communities in Chicago, everything from farming chickens yourself to, you know, helping build community gardens um, in places, specifically in a place like Chicago, we have, we had, you know, a lot of low income families. And so how do you help them from the land that already exists? How do you grow the correct vegetables that grow well in the climate that Chicago has? So, you know, just kind of the dream exhibit to work on, honestly. And I, that as one of the, I would say that 
mummies is the very last thing I really worked on. I made, I helped make the videos and I, um, I made some sound design, but that exhibit was just such a, from the beginning to the end, I got to be a part of it and ideate and work with curators and scientists. And it was just, I, I got to go to every single collection and make a video of every collection in the field museum with no music, just like visual poetry, I guess is what they called it. And I was just nerding out so hard because I was like, I could do whatever I wanted. You know, I started losing my mind and being like, I'm going to make a stop animation, stop motion animation out of this one. And like the leads of the different collections were just like, OK, yeah, you're you're the creative here. And I was just like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> it's yeah. So so that job I can't give enough thanks to. But it came from such a meager beginning of me just through my university finding a program that pairs you with an institution. Um, and I, I'm thankful for my university for having that. And I'm very thankful for the Field Museum continuously keeping me around. I mean, I worked there, I would never stop. Even in the summer, I was like, I can't get enough of this place. So um, still very much love it there. And you should definitely go. And if you do, I will help with a special behind the scenes tour for you because you have to see some of the cool, weird stuff. I have uh, in my bucket list going to the Chicago Film Museum. Really? For sure. <laughs> okay, well, let's because make it I've been I've been into the Science Museum at Boston, the Boston City okay. Science Museum, and yeah, it was yeah. really really cool. But you know, it's better when you have friends <laughs> that give you, you know, the, the special tour of the yeah, wheels. Of so that, 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 that doesn't help. <laughs> um, um, and the the question here is how this previous experience that you have with several jobs help you in your current work at GPL? So I think the first thing that's an important skill that I learned even as a as a kid, and so I, I read a lot as a as a child. I still read. Um, I think I didn't consume literature like I did as a child because I'd read a bunch of children's books but obviously I was very into reading into the idea of storytelling into writing so I think writing has been very important in my career um, being able to take ideas that are very highly complex someone's you know PhD through after body of work and then condense it into something that anyone from a child to you know a, a grandma, grandpa, elderly person would understand. Um, and so I think really my career moved into more, after the field, I, I moved to New York and I did much more like industry-based jobs, which were like editing for different, um, different, you know, freelance things, um, different networks, etc. cetera. Um, I also worked at a design and development studio that made websites, which was awesome. So it was like diving into the technical parts. I felt like it was very much my training era, you know, where I was like, okay, like school was awesome. I didn't learn any, everything I needed to in terms of how the industry works. So it kind of helped me with those skills. And so when I did end up, uh, getting even interviewed at the, at the at JPL for the first time, it was actually for the communications job that I had mentioned before. And there they needed very strong writing skills. They needed really strong communication skills. They needed you to have a prior ability to condense very, very complex things into something understandable. And I, I remember I actually applied on LinkedIn for my job there. And, <laughs> and I remember having a feeling where I was like, I was reading the description and I was like, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. And, you know, I had so much imposter syndrome because I was like, but it's NASA. Like, whoa. And then I was like, yeah, but you can do this. Like, you you know how to do this stuff. I was, what's, just write the cover letter, do the thing, and just do it. And so I, in two days, I applied for that job. And I had a different job at the time, which I was quite unhappy with. Um, it was fine, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't fulfilling that little thing that I felt, you know, sophomore year when I first connected the science and art thing. Um, and so, so just finally apply to stuff because I probably have like over 500 cover letters. I have them in my, in one of my folders that I've written where I have never heard a response back. And this is from, you know, grants to things. This is starting probably from high Good school. Good to even. know. <laughs> or you just, 
you never hear anything. And and that's another thing is like, I don't think people should respect people with saying at least that you don't have the job or you didn't get the grant because hearing what? nothing is like, come on. Um, so that's a critique of everyone else, not me. Yeah. I always so even she mailed so, me back and say, no, you're not the fit for this opposition. And I'll be fine. It's OK. But this yeah, awful when you don't give any response back. It's like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, you're just basically like, but uh, I, okay, well, fine. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I was right, 28 million acres. I just had to check that my number was correct about the, sorry, this is my type A personality. Uh, I was just like, I don't want to be recorded saying the wrong thing. Um, so the communication was really came in handy. Um, and I applied with the knowledge base that I had. My interview was very long. And then I waited for a very long time, long enough that I actually was like, I didn't get it. And they just didn't call me. Um, and then I remember I was flying to visit my brother in New York from Los Angeles. And I got this voice memo on my phone when I landed. And I was like, okay. And I'm listening. And they're like, hi, this is JPL. We'd like to schedule a phone interview. And I was like, what? <laughs> I had not totally forgotten about it, but I figured because it had been several months that, you know, they just found someone else. And no, I guess bureaucracy is real when you're government funded. So they really have to, you know, and they we're interviewing several people. So, so yeah, um, I think the communication skills also, they help you with the interviews. It builds your confidence when you're able to be eloquent in what you're saying and be able to talk about the work that you've done before, right? So I would say that's really what's carried over. The more you write and the more you're able to just, you know, pinpoint ideas and be really succinct um, will help you with, with anything. Because, you know, I think in the kind of culture that has been created with tech and, you know, that's the world I'm in now, I even like making a slide deck that you can immediately like pinpoint what you're talking about, get people excited, you know, and get the thing you want them to experience out of what you're showing them is really important it's kind of hard to pinpoint that um and i think that comes from just doing it a lot and also failing a lot which is definitely two things that i have done a lot <laughs> make things happen and also fail and failing is good because you learn and it hurts it hurts sometimes but i think that hurt i always remember things that i had to give up on or things that I had to say no to, or when I realized something was going wrong, how difficult it is to let go of something. But I think that's the stuff that actually makes you grow as a person and kind of get this thicker skin where you're like, okay, now I can kind of think back on it and say, it's fine, you know, no regrets. <laughs> yeah, that's great that you're telling about uh, rejection and a bunch of notes because I've been there Probably so many times, according to myself, but probably I didn't enough knows, I guess, at, yeah. at this point. But yeah, you, you learn from, from those. Even with these interviews, trying to get people to do this, and you know, in my very small channel, um, yeah. see this girl. When it's, it's harder when people don't know you because mm, mm -hmm. they don't know if you are true or you are telling the truth. So it's harder to, ah, this is me. This is my videos. I, and I do this. So getting a, even a no in that aspect is like, first it's like, mm, but then it's like, okay, I'll find someone else. <laughs> it's fine. Exactly. I mean, I think, the, I think the world is full of a lot of people that are willing to talk about what they do and also you know, your your channel is growing. It's nice to be a part of or help you somehow in, or I feel, I'm not really helping you. I love having this conversation with you and in a way that can also maybe shed light onto what even I wanted to. I looked at your channel and I was like, this is cool. Maybe I should start a YouTube channel, but no. Now <laughs> I'll just keep great. on, I'll just keep on <laughs> partnering up with you. I'll, 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 I, even though I do edit, so maybe this could be a, like a collaborative thing. So we will talk about this later. I have plans. <laughs> okay. So to give just people context, what's GPL? Yes. So it's confusing to just say JPL. So JPL is stands for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's a NASA center. Um, so there are several NASA centers scattered all over the U.S. Um, there are 10 total, and some of them are what JPL is, which is a federally funded research and development facility. 
FFRDC, if you want to be cool with the acronyms, because NASA loves acronyms. Um, so what that means is that we're actually government funded, but we're not part of NASA as civil servants or government workers. Um, what that means is we're actually part of Caltech as um, as a company. So Caltech is where we first originated. And JPL actually originated in the mid 30s, way before NASA was an agency. Um, around 1936 is when we started. And it was started by a group of crazy kind of pioneering um, guys that were trying to shoot things into space at the Caltech campus. And uh, because of, and this is the short story, there's a lot of cool reading on, on JPL. Um, so because of an accidental explosion, um, Theodore von Karman, who was then the president of Caltech said, hey, why don't you guys go five miles into the desert and start doing these, these experiments that are super dangerous. So that's really, we're in the Arroyo, um, in the desert, really close to Caltech, but far enough away that an explosion couldn't hurt anything. And we started building rockets. So we're actually the first place for the US to start building ballistic missiles, doing ballistic missile testing. And that grew into, after Sputnik was launched in the, in the USSR, um, actually Explorer 1, which is the first spacecraft for America, was, was built um, at JPL. And so that's really when NASA started as well, is, is, when, is when Explorer 1 was built. And so we were known jet propulsion. It's called jet propulsion, not rocket propulsion, because at the time they thought jet um, was not super, like rocket sounded like, jet sounded kind of futuristic, rocket didn't sound like that. And so we don't actually build rockets anymore at JPL. Um, SpaceX builds those. We actually build the payloads and what's on them. So you might be thinking like, where are the astronauts? Different centers do different things. JPL actually, we only build robotic missions. So before humans can go explore things, robots go and explore things and take scientific data. Uh, scientific data then is, you know, studied for years and years and years. Um, and so we are the ones that build the robots and send them to space before humans can go. Um, so it's cool because we predate NASA, so we get to have that cool little like star. Um, but we're also, you know, we collaborate with all the other NASA centers um, that do different work. Um, my work also takes me to Johnson Space Center sometimes where the astronauts actually are and where they train. And it is very cool. Um, and I still get all like, oh, when I see an astronaut, um, because <laughs> they are, they're such unique humans. Um, but but also, you work there. <laughs> I know, but I, I'm a dork. Um, but they're just like, they're kind of magical, but also anyone can apply to be an astronaut. If you, uh, there's the beat, I think, I don't know when the deadline is, I should look this up, but really? there's a be an astronaut. Yeah, uh, let me just, let me let me see. Sorry, I'm going to Google really fast. Be an astronaut. I, I don't know when the timeline is, depending on when you release this. But they can look it up. Um, you do have to be a U.S. citizen for the astronaut program, at, you know, for us. But um, that doesn't mean that you can't somehow get into it another way. There are other astronaut programs in Japan, in Russia, um, in India, um, everywhere. So, uh, yeah. But if someone does have is listening and does have U.S. citizenship and wants to be an astronaut, it's possible to apply. You just need, uh, let me see, citizenship, a bachelor's degree um, in physical sciences, bio biology, mathematics, or engineering, and some kind of three-year experience in the field. So it's not crazy. Um, they're not like out of bounds. It's possible. Um, so everyone should apply if they can. Yeah, but because it's, it's it's super cool. The question here is, have you ever wanted to be an astronaut? Um, it's hard because I'm very claustrophobic. So I would say <laughs> I would be the most that's, terrified astronaut. Just talking to you, that's why I like you. I'm like you. <laughs> I'm super I think, I'm very claustrophobic. I think I'd need to be sedated and then just slingshotted into space because there's no way I would have a panic attack. Um, I do think I respect it a lot, but this is also is often for guys as a whole when we talk about things because we'll be like Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. That's what our meetings are like. Um, no, but we're talking about robotic missions. We're talking about, you know, there are a lot of very funny phrases that we say that we're used to, but sometimes it's like, 
where on earth, right? And so something really important that JPL also does is earth sciences and studying what we're doing here and how can we can improve things to, um, to make our planet better. Um, and to just simply read out what we're doing with our satellites that are in low earth orbit, looking at, you know, a bunch of data sets um, that people can actually explore. If, if you go and Google uh, global image, um, Global, global image, it's called Gibbs dataset. What does the B stand for? My internet is being so slow. So you can browse a bunch of cool earth data um, that are taken um, all around uh, NAS different, NASA, different NASA centers. Um, yeah. And I would encourage you to do that. So the one cool thing about NASA is that I always, global imagery browse services, Gibbs, G-I-B-S. Um, all of the data that NASA puts out are all there for people to take and do things with. So any picture of a star, cluster or nebula, all of the pictures the Mars Curiosity rover takes on Mars, name the robotic mission, name the astronaut, whatever, um, Voyager, uh, all, of, all of those pictures, all of that stuff, even to the ones and zeros is available for anyone to take and use. So it's all in the public domain. And we really love when people do something creative um, with the things that are available. And as I said, when I started in communications, when I learned that, I was like, what? Why doesn't everybody know about this? And it's just because, you know, communication is hard to give out to the whole world in such a way. And so in my small part, uh, when I had that job, um, the biggest thing I did was was create the first 360 for for NASA social media release, and that was cool for me because it was the first time that you're that more people when 360 video came out could actually stand where Curiosity is standing and say, "Wow, I'm on Mars." And you know now that seems a bit dated. This was 2016, but then it was like, "Whoa, this is the first time." And it's also most a lot of people have cell phones that could have processed that and shown the YouTube or at least maybe a computer. So it also like increases this footprint of education. Um, and so if someone comes away from that, just having a tiny bit of knowledge, even like there's a rover on Mars and her name is Curiosity, um, that's enough. I think like that maybe plants a kernel in someone's mind to say, huh, maybe I'll look that up sometime or like have a tab open on your computer for 10 years about it. Um, but that's, yeah, I think that's a win. That's like a small victory for us. So if you could explain what your job is, will be really cool. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, to, just to give context, because I know the people is going to be like, hmm, so. What is she talking about? She's talking <laughs> me again. Um, so, so the first job that I had was, called multimedia specialist. So I worked a lot with social media. I worked with communication. I worked with taking complex ideas from science that comes out at JPL and, and relating it to as many people as we could. So growing this footprint, um, increasing education, working with our education department to kind of continuously provide content for public engagement. Um, after I made the 360, this was February 2016-ish, uh, I became really interested in this like immersive thing that was happening. And I had studied some virtual reality stuff and, you know, virtual caves and all of that in university a bit. And it was having this resurgent, right? Uh, VR was coming back, augmented reality was on the cusp. And so uh, there was a job for a producer for, in the ops lab, um, which is where I work now. Uh, I started as a producer, which was a new title there. That's like, people are like, what does that mean? That means that you basically do a bunch of things. Um, what the Ops Lab is, is a bunch of developers and designers, about a group of anywhere from 20 to 30, depending on the projects that we have. And we're kind of an innovation lab. So we try and help make scientists and engineers jobs easier by creating software to do that. And a lot of that software even before I started, was done through virtual reality and augmented reality. So how can you actually have a scientist immerse in their data? Um, so as a producer, I worked on several projects that I still work on now, but after being there now for three years, I have become the deputy manager, which means I'm um, there's a manager of the lab and I'm kind of the second in charge. So I try to help 
you know, inspire the lab, come up with new ideas, um, make sure everyone's happy that we have the funding we need, that we consistently are challenging our creativity and challenging what, you know, most of JPL needs in terms of how do we picture this in a new way. Um, and then I also lead a project called Protospace, which I can kind of delve into in a second here. Um, but I'm probably confusing when I say augmented reality, virtual reality. What is she talking yeah, about? Yeah, I was, I was about to example. ask you, what yeah. is the difference and what is virtual yeah. reality and augmented reality? So virtual reality is when you're actually completely in a headset by yourself. Usually uh, you, you cannot see the world around you. You have headphones on. You're completely immersed in a world. And it's it can be a single experience. It can be a shared experience. Um, now you can have devices that aren't tagged up to big computers so you can move around like oculus quest is awesome um but it's very much you're gonna walk into stuff if you try to walk around um augmented reality on the other hand is something that can both live in your phone as a device and also in uh a different a lot of different kinds of headsets i can actually show one hold on let me get it real quick okay <laughs> so what i'm going to show you is a device that we work with a lot and it's called the HoloLens, and as you can see, it's kind of like goggles, so you can still see the world around you, but inside, these little kind of glasses, and they basically um, project a hologram over the real world. So I'm going to put this on to show people what it looks like. Um, so this is what it looks like. And what I'm seeing is an overlay menu and a bunch of different stuff. So for, for this, you kind of wear it like a bike helmet and you can, you know, pull it in and out. So I'm still seeing you, but I'm seeing you with an overlay on you. So what's really nice about this is that you're not fully, look at my hair, that's very nice. Um, you're not fully immersed in your world, but you're able to collaborate a lot better. So um, an example of the first project that we ever did in augmented reality is called OnSite, which is basically made for geologists. Um, geologists study the surface of Mars in a 2D way, or they used to. So how do we get pictures of Mars? We get them from orbital data from orbiters that are on Mars or from on the ground data from rovers. One of the latest rovers is Mars Curiosity rover, um, but we're actually launching another one in July. So July of this year, we're, we're launching the Perseverance rover. Um, Rovers take pictures of both themselves and the terrain the, around. The Perseverance is the one that got named like yeah. a couple months ago, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. actually a month ago and it was named by a student. We have an essay writing contest. So, and then a bunch of different judges from JPL and other centers read the essays and then, um, you know, we do a deduction. So it's like very much a hands-on process. Um, and it's, it's, it's for, I believe, um, students through high school to to be able to compete. I believe that's right. I don't think we do college kids. I think it's supposed to be a younger generation. And their essays are amazing. And I think you can actually find them online. Um, the the last contenders and why they wanted to name what they want, why the names they picked were the names they picked. Um, so our first program that we wrote actually took what the rover Curiosity takes pictures of mixed it with orbital data and created a 3D mesh, a terrain mesh that scientists could actually walk around on. So when you put this on, you would see a terrain around you and you're able to actually put little points on the ground and say, hey, this rock is interesting. It has a paired web experience. So if you don't have one of these or you don't want care about using this, you can actually just go on the web and experience three dimensionality there where you can click around, set points of interest and see 2D images that match with that terrain. So it's kind of this innovative way of taking something 2D, making it 3D and immersing scientists, but then again, allowing them to meet on the surface of Mars, just like they would meet on the surface of the earth to describe things that they're interested in studying and geological places that they'd like the rover to do different work in. So it's this wonderful way for the people that um, are studying the surface of Mars planetary geologists to communicate with the rover planners and the people that are actually controlling the robot on Mars to be able to really like have this collaborative process. Um, so it's kind of this innovative thing and it was it was the first um, project 
made for, first application made for this device. So we got to work with Microsoft really early. Microsoft are the ones who make this um, HoloLens. And that really started kind of this new pipeline of working. So our lab really kind of took the bull by the horns in the project. And so from then, from there, we innovated um, and created more products like um, the Protospace project that I lead. It takes computer models, um, CAD models, uh, which are really complicated engineering models for those of you that don't know. And put yeah, them I was about to ask you about the, the, the Protospace because when, when I check it out, for me, the concept, it was like very complicated and very yeah. complex. And how do you manage to put something like super complex in, you know, like you, you say in science communication, to yeah. put something like super complex in a, in an easy way to, to people to understand what the project yeah. it is. So for me, it was like, I mean, look super cool, but I was like, okay, yeah. this, is, this is really like complex to me to process because even I um, checked, you have like uh, in your webpage, like the picture of the astronaut. Mm -hmm. Then remember his name? Scott Kelly. Kelly. Uh huh. Scott uh, Kelly. The, that uh, prototype was like, actually test on the, mm -hmm. on the, in space. Yeah. So good. <laughs> and we're continuing to do that work. Um, so Protospace, uh, the base of it is CAD models, which sounded, stands for Computer Aided Design. Um, so it's a way for engineers to really, basically anything that you build, you can build in a CAD model and you can get down to the granularity of both what's inside and outside of the model. And so that's put together in polygons or shapes that create you know, the whole thing. So if you think about anything being created out of small little shapes, that's basically how it works. They're huge models. They're really hard to make. They're really hard to sort of like work with. Um, it's very heavy handed. But uh, Protospace was basically designed to be able to wear one of these or again, be on the web and see the model that you've been working on for years and years and years to be able to see it in full scale right in front of you and to say, oh, this is how big this is. So basically really doing easy work because you're looking at it full scale. So you can actually take tools that you have, match them up to what you're designing. So literally taking something out of a screen, if I was able to like pull you out of the screen and talk to you, that's basically what we're trying to do with Protospace and these very complex models. And so you might be asking, how does Scott Kelly, how does the astronaut aspect work with it? Well, because we figured out this way to render things on this HoloLens that are very complex and big, we're able to also overlay instructions as well. So our work with astronauts and astronauts in training has been, instead of them reading pieces of paper or them reading like um, electronic instructions, they're actually able to put one of these devices on and see all the instructions overlaid over their actual environment. So the picture I have of Scott Kelly is him doing a very, like rem uh, this was our first test with the product where he was asked to do something very simple with a remote assistance person from mission control talking him through it on earth and him seeing the instructions all virtually overlaid in front of him. So instead of him being like, okay, so I have to do this and I have to do this, he's able to be like, okay, I see all of the models. I see what I need to do. I see my highlights. And so a lot of the work for Protospace and my, I, Big ups to my wonderful team. Um, they're amazing. Uh, they're a group of designers and developers, and we have user research designers, user interface designers, and we have 3D developers and web developers. Um, and How many people are we talking about? We have nine. So including me, we have 10 people on my team. That's not that lot. Ten, so much work for 10 people is like a huge thing. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's they always just everyone in the ops lab I, I feel like is extremely special and it I also feel like anyone we also have interns that come in constantly so this is a job if this sounds interesting to anyone listening if you're interested in software development or augmented reality virtual reality we are looking for interns all the time so I would ask them to inquire with me or um, go on the intern uh, page for JPL, which I believe is interns.jpl.nasa.gov, but I will make sure of that. Um, so yeah, so the idea of working with astronauts has been really exciting for me and to see, you know, we do a lot of research to actually understand, 
is this helpful? Are we actually doing something that will help them or are we just making their process a lot more complicated? Um, and we've published now two papers on the subject. So I think that validates the work. It helps to, you know, put us in this like more validity inside of the science world to say, you know, we're actually doing cold hard research. We're continuously seeing if this is worth it. Um, and us in a, you know, this is not a novel concept, but we've been working on this project and other projects for long enough that we do have this kind of understanding. Yeah. How many that. times does it took like the development of these projects? I you mean, these about are years, long, right? yeah, years, years, several years. Um, so the cool thing is though, for people at home, so the project I called onsite, the Mars walk, um, you can actually experience this from your own home today by going to accessmars.com. So we basically took the same concept of on-site and put it into a web uh, development experience. So you can actually go with some collaboration with creative apps. Um, they helped to make it. We helped with the content and the direction. So you can actually walk on the surface of Mars um, through your computer or desktop. Um, so that's pretty cool. So it's the same data. I think it'll make a lot more sense when you're actually looking at the real thing rather than me describing Mars to you, which is like not the most, uh, not the best thing. Um, and so for protospace, the very complex computer modeling, you can uh, download Spacecraft AR on your phone. And Spacecraft AR is just an AR app, augmented reality app that lets you look through a bunch of different spacecraft at full scale um, that are currently flying with NASA, um, robotic spacecraft. So you can actually I'll have- may, I'll make sure to put all the links on the description yeah. box when I upload this, but I actually downloaded Yay! the spacecraft because I needed to check it out myself because I'm pretty sure I'll be using this one to make my videos because I think uh, for this point, now I'll be creating more videos about the space because I actually have two. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there are two, of, and those are really, really good content that I have put out there. So you know, and I'm not a, as I said, I'm not a scientist. So if you need help with also connecting with, you know, the people that are experts in their fields, um, I'm happy to do that. If what if you what if you just go nuts and you're like, I'm super into black holes, and you just dive deep into black holes. That sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah. I can only help you like on oh, a very sure. high level. I am not touting that I know more than just like a basic understanding of how to explain black holes because they're super complicated, um, but they're also very exciting and unknown and there's so much more research to be done on them. So what, I don't know, maybe you'll just, the sky's the limit, the sky and beyond. Yeah, space, it's awesome because I love, you know, I have a background in biology. I know a bunch of stuff about biology, animals, plants, fungi, whatever. But the space is, you know, an unexplored field for me. So when yeah. I approach to that, to those subjects, it's like, hmm, let's see what, what, I, what I can do. And it's a really, a really fun. So okay. when, okay. go ahead. Yeah, when you talk about the spacecraft a year and that NASA put all the content out there, and I, w I want to uh, take that subject uh, from the previous uh, talk, is um, how do you feel about uh, a, like engagement with, with people and putting all these uh, things out there for them? Because, you know, like, like I, I said, product space is like a very complex, but then we have a very friendly app that mm -hmm. is spacecraft year. So how, how how is the balance of very hard to simple? Yes. <laughs> well, the idea is for the public engagement work. Um, it's really to inspire a new generation of explorers for me, at least, or at least to have people feel like this information is within their reach and something that they can have access to and something that they can explore further with all the free content that NASA provides. Um, as well as JPL and other NASA centers. I think that condensing into saying, you know, this is not exactly what our engineers use to build spacecraft before they machine any part of them, but this is something that you can start to understand as a concept. And for a lot of people, specifically young girls growing up, myself included, I don't think we're seeing a lot of like hard engineering or hard science things geared towards a younger generation. And so with this new advent of 
augmented reality in terms of how popular it's becoming. And yes, I don't think everyone in the world has a phone, so it's not, you know, not everyone can see this. But in terms of viewership of instead of no one's going to have one of these really, but how many people have a phone? Many people. And so kind of growing that footprint and saying, you know, check this out. Or, you know, some kid could see it. Some small child could be like, this is okay, but I think I could do better and program, you know, learn unity and program something that's way crazier than what we made. And that challenge is awesome too. So I think the point of it is to take the tools that are already being created in this world of software, because software is, software is sort of like art in a way to me, because it's super never ending. I think the possibilities are endless. There's creative coding, there's, there's, you know, 3D programming. There's, I mean, there, I'm not going to name how much programming you can do, but you can go from very simple things to very complex things. And I think that's the beauty, right? So um, it's really for, for, for us and for me specifically, it's, um, it's about the inspiration part of it and just spreading the knowledge specifically for science, technology, um, engineering and math um, and art as well. Yeah. You know, I like, like I said, even though uh, space is not my main thing, we have something in common, and that's science communication. And everything yeah. you're saying is the, th the truth, and I relate so hard to it because that's right. You know, you're yeah. just just trying to engage people and get them excited, and you share your work. But for for you, uh, probably it's like, oh, this is the thing I do every day that I enjoy it. But for me, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like that's the thing so too, many levels that... of excitement right now. <laughs> At the end of the day, strip the jobs away, strip whatever away. I'm a person, right? And so yeah. I also think the reason that I frame myself as an artist or a creative technologist rather than being like, oh, I work at NASA, because the I work at NASA thing feels intimidating to people. And it shouldn't be, because NASA is a place that you can also work. Anyone can work. And by you, I mean the person watching this. By you, I mean you. Sophia, like, I think it's, I, I do think that it's, possible for people and so I also like to be the advocate to say hey this is something that you're super interested in I did not originally dream I would work for NASA I had a, an interest in all of these different technologies those technologies and communications ended up leading me to JPL because they had a job that was perfect for me that I was able to grow in and then I knew probably like this much about space and after working there now for five years I know this much about space just because I'm like a sponge for information. I like to learn more. I like to be able to maybe help people with the way that they're communicating what they're saying. And so all of it is being able to learn. Jobs are just learning more and more information. Jobs are being able to communicate better. Jobs are, you know, that's what they're there for. And um, as soon as that goes away, then I feel like, you know, the job isn't right for me anywhere. But um, at this point, I just, I'm still excited by a lot of the work specifically with with just engaging with the public and, and teaching the public about things. Um, even though that's not part of my job anymore as in the ops lab, it's still, I still connect it back because that's like the passion. Yeah, um, you're, you're doing it and you're doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah, and again, it's not just me, it's, it's an effort of like um, so many people behind yeah. this project and collaborators and also JPL employees. And I feel very happy to be in an environment where I can, you know, receive receive the ability and the, the space to be able to, ha, huh, the space, ha, ha, uh, the space to be able to do what I'm doing. Um, you know, because sometimes I feel like I kind of push on stuff a little more than people would like, but I think that's also a good aspect of how I've gotten to where I want to be right now. How do you choose your projects? I mean, like, you have, like, five projects, and mm, yeah. today we're going to work in this one, or what, what's the, the process like? For us, it's usually the requests come in through a need, right? And so someone will come and say, hey, we have this thing that we're using, this program, we don't really, how can we do this differently? And so that's where a project starts and that's more of like a research and development and task. Um, for me, because my focus is actually finishing protospace and seeing it through um, the CAD model um, complex uh, project, I focus a lot of my time on making sure that I have the correct project planning, the correct vision to see the team through um, the end of, of the project. So a lot of strategic planning, a lot of kind of boring businessy stuff, actually. But 
at first I was like, oh no, like I have to do all of these presentations. I have to do this return on investment. Like suddenly it came financials and all of this. But that helped me grow in terms of a business mind and sort of research how all of that works. So it made me feel a lot more confident when I walk into a room now and present things because a lot, a lot of the people at my work aren't used to that kind of, um, or not not everyone I should say, but sometimes they're like, oh, this project is not that old and they already have this vision, right? And they have this, uh, this roadmap. Um, and so it makes me feel more confident and it makes the people I work with feel more confident and they understand what's going on and I can explain what we're doing. And so it just clarifies a lot. So I'm again, yeah, my job is sometimes writing a lot of emails and it is presentations, it is meetings. And so it's not all like, we just look up at the stars and dream. Um, that's how I feel a lot in here when I'm writing, when I'm using PowerPoint, but you still have to do boring things as well. So I don't want to make it seem that it's just excitement with me. What part of your work do you enjoy the most? Obviously not PowerPoint. But... I shouldn't say bad things about PowerPoint, but you know, it's, it's PowerPoint. It's, it's useful. Um, yeah. I would say... I mean, I think collaborating with people is really exciting. Um, I think being able to be part of a team now that has grown so much um, with the amount of responsibility that different team members have taken on and how communication and like friendship has grown in that process has been really just beautiful to me um, because I hadn't really seen a team through something like this before. And so... I think that's wonderful. We, we work in a very open lab. So our lab is completely like no cubicles. It's just like desks all in three rooms together. So you can be like, hey, and, like scream through the other room. So it's very much about, and I know that's not a new concept in a lot of tech, but for us being like an older company, it is kind of like, ooh, what are they doing? Um, but it's just really nice to sometimes even like you know, to, to goof off and watch a video together or something to remember that we are humans and that work can be fun and it doesn't have to always be, you know, stressful or deadlines and all of that. So I would say collaboration within our group and with other groups is what I really love the most. Um, and again, connecting things back to the public um, to show off what we do in a more understandable way and like, you know, spark that curiosity. Do you ever do you ever feel pressure about it? Like, oh, I'm such a machine. <laughs> I need to I need to do the things right. I think I did a lot, and then lately I have relaxed about it because I have to remember that I'm a person. You have to as so working hard is so such a thing of our generation where it's like always working. I'm so busy. Everyone's working. Blah, blah, blah. But also, I'm just like no. Maybe I'm going to take time for myself. I want to go to my studio and draw something. Or I want to take a break and play some music. Um, giving yourself, or I just want to watch TV. That's also okay. Giving yourself the space and time to be a normal human and not always. I used to be like, I have to be perfect and act perfectly. And when people meet me, I can't be funny. And I can't, and it's like, I, well, obviously I'm not hiding anything today. And this is just. It's just me. I don't think I can, I can suppress it down, but then it's just going to volcano back up. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the same thing here. Like I'm going to act like super professional, very serious, but I can, this is my personality. So I can being, being, I'm sorry. being funny and being like engaging and like being goofy, I think is important. It also relaxes other people. And again, yeah, as I said, we can't help it. So what are you going to do? Yeah, right now when you say like watch a movie, I checked and I know that you have a collaboration with Hollywood and the movies and stuff. Yeah. And I don't know if you know, but I kind of obsessed with the TV shows and movies and okay. you know like the production process of making things. And right now when you when you mention a strategy and stuff, this is the thing I enjoy because you know having an, an idea these days is kind of complicated like I said you're not discovering anything new it's just mm -hmm. trying to make things that I already know but better yeah so with with uh with movies I want to know about that collaboration because I know you collaborated with the uh, people from Interstellar, The Martian and my favorite Wally because Disney 
as you can see. <laughs> You're a fan. So actually, um, I was only really part of the team. And my first team that I was on in communications, that was when The Martian came out. And so there's actually a thing called the Hollywood Exchange here in Los Angeles. And they pair people that are writing about space. And um, specifically, if it's robotic missions, then they have specialists from JPL um, help them. So for The Martian specifically, because that did have scenes at JPL and... Um, it was really based on engineering. Um, we had a lot of Hollywood people come through and kind of just observe how people dress and act. Um, but then also when they have certain script revisions and certain you know models of things, they'll have an expert say, actually, no, the rover would look like this or this, like, this, this rover wouldn't have this wheel like this because X, Y, Z. Or you know, gravity doesn't work like that um, on this planet. Or, you know, so they really dig down. And so specifically with The Martian, I found that they wanted to have a very scientifically accurate movie, which is why so many JPLers were like, this is our favorite movie. Um, my former manager actually worked on the Wally work as well as, um, as, well, as well as Interstellar. I can't speak to that because I was not on the team then, but it's the same. It's just making sure that what they're trying to communicate and not all movies. But the really awesome ones do because the research of making sure you're being appropriate and not just completely kind of making things up, um, even with sci-fi, is super important um, because you want to at least make things a bit believable because that's why movies are effective, right? That's what makes yeah. them work. Yeah. So talking about Wally, I think Wally is a very unrated movie because it's a it's a it's I a, love Wally. It's a piece of art. Just, yeah, just saying. I, I really love it. And I actually I, feel like the cleaning robot, especially <laughs> during this pandemic. I'm like always like cleaning everything. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm just thinking about you know like the fat people in the spaceship. Like, oh, I, I need to avoid that. <laughs> so just uh, to finish uh, this conversation and letting you go, mm -hmm. uh, um, if you could give an advice to a person that want to follow your path, that want to be a producer or want to work at NASA or want to, yeah, to be a producer, what's, what's the, the advice for them? I would say, I think I'm gonna maybe repeat what I said before in terms of um, really starting early and getting your experience in a career that gives you the opportunity to kind of explore different possibilities. So for me, that was my field museum internship. I think seriously, without that, I would not be anywhere near where I am today because that built my confidence, that built my knowledge base, that let me experiment with different, both types of personalities of people, as well as different, um, you know, methods of doing things, of processes and of hardware and of software. So it allowed me to build this repertoire of experience in school and outside of school that is just, you can't put a price on it. Um, and I'm super thankful to be able to have it, uh, to have had that experience, but I also know that I pushed for it. So that early career, um, and there's no, early career means anytime. I, anyone can switch their career anytime. And it's just like having a little bit of forward thought of being like, thinking about what you want to do and sort of how can I just start going into that direction, right? So even if it's taking an online course on, let's say you wanted to get into the movies, take an online course in screenwriting, you know, just these small steps that take you closer to the goal um, and having it be an actually physical thing that you can have at the end of the day um, to show, hey, I did this um, is super, super helpful. I think it's been helpful for me and I hope that's helpful to people. Yeah, it, it, believe me, it is. It is. <laughs> okay. So, um, where could, where can people can find you? Twitter, Instagram. So yeah, I Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I'm uh, at Cloud Sasha, C L O U D S A S H A. And if you go to cloudsasha.com, you can see some of these projects. Um, and then we'll also post the rest of the links to all of the products down below. Huh. Yeah, that that was, thank you very much. <laughs> You are doing your part. Now you're a YouTuber. <laughs> so you're thinking. 
Um, yeah. And so please, as I said, I like to talk to people. So any of you want to reach out and ask more questions? I know I speak kind of quickly sometimes, and I just went over a lot of content in sort of a short amount of time, but I'm happy to dig into any of these questions further with anyone. So yeah, thank you, Sasha, very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Amigos, ella fue Sasha Samoshina. Este, síganla en sus redes sociales, que no se les olvide suscribirse, compartir esos videos y seguirla, porque la verdad es que su trabajo sí está bien padre. No se lo pierdan, compartan estos videos y nos vemos en la siguiente entrevista, en el siguiente video, en el siguiente blog. Hasta luego.